to our next speaker, Dale Boucher. He is the CEO of Deltian Innovations Limited, a for-profit corporation developing robot mining technologies for Earth and space, a guest lecturer at Colorado School of Mines, and the chair of the Planetary and Terrestrial Mining Sciences Symposium, and co-chair of the Space Resources Roundtable. Welcome, Dale. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I have... I have one question for you, actually, now that you have yes. everybody at your disposal and it's your company. Do you like it pronounced Deltian or Deltian? Uh, it's Deltian. Deltian, well, over to you, CEO of Deltian In Innovations Limited. Thank you. Thanks, and, and I just, I absolutely have to say to you again, that was, a, that was an absolutely great talk. I, uh, first and second, I love that one. Okay, so the talk is about really you want to be a space miner, and there's a question mark there for a very good reason. Let's see if I can get through this. We've lost your sound, Dale. Huh? Oh, you're back okay. now. Okay, so my clicker is not working. So if we could advance slides, please. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. All right, so space mining is really about extracting resources and it's where the shovel hits the dirt. Then. It's, it's where you really interact with the surface in, in some fashion. Space mining, in my perspective, is not about necessarily converting Martian atmosphere into propellant. It's about converting the dirt into something that's useful. And, and I really love this little graphic because um, it, it really kind of depicts the prospecting stage of, of the mining. Uh, next slide, please. So every mine on the planet uh, runs on a mining cycle. And, 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 and this is arguably a vague definition of what a mining cycle looks like. It goes from exploration into, into the actual mining to some kind of refining product and implementation. There are a number of other stages that are in there. And what I'm here to tell you is that this mining cycle does not tell the entire story. There is a lot of stuff that is really uh, missing. But What's important here is, is what I'm about to talk about, is what goes into supporting this mining cycle. Next slide, please. So mining needs a supply chain. And if we're the folks on the left, we're the ones out doing the, you know, the grubbing for the gold and, and, and panning and, and doing that kind of thing. But what's interesting is that during the Yukon gold rush in Canada, for example, there was a lot of money made selling bacon grease and, and, and you know, a 50 pound bag of flour. Uh, there was hotels, there was, there was groceries, there was uh, pickaxe salesmen, that kind of stuff. And, and in a survey in 2013 to the Canadian mining industry, it was shown that between two and four jobs in mining supply are directly related to a mining extraction operation, which is kind of significant. And that's really what I'm here to talk about, is the supply chain of things and how this all gets put together. Next slide, please. So this is a really telling slide, and in, in this slide, there are essentially four phases of mining, and, and the exploration phase, development phase, operations, and closure. And look at the timelines. The exploration phase runs from seven to 10 years, development runs from five to 10 years, operations typically 10 to two to 20 years, and closure of the mine, which is rehabilitation, basically two to 10 years. There, uh, if we go back to exploration, it's involving mineral resource assessment, mineral exploration, deposit appraisal, regulatory issues, uh, and, 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 and that really takes a long time. If we look at the chart in the top right-hand side, that's a typical chart for a mining exploration activity. And it's got a, you know, a list of people that they need and, and what kind of, of uh, vehicles they might need a truck to get around. Uh, they need some lodging, they, you know, they need to have um, some resource uh, um, uh, evaluation capabilities. Um, and it, it uh, typically, you know, $3, $3 million is not unusual to spend on that kind of exploration activity. Um, there are companies that I've talked to in the past who have spent $270 million in one year to do exploration activity. Um, and, and the interesting part of this is that it's contracted out. It's not necessarily the mining company that will do that. The mining company will contract out the exploration activity. And, 
and expiration, if, if you uh, think about the, the, the mining operation as going on, expiration is a continuous activity. So when a mine starts up um, and they begin to extract resources, they're continually exploring, trying to improve the knowledge of their ore reserves and trying to understand how the return on investment is going to work. Um, and, and so the expiration is a continuous activity. It's very intensive at the start to try and find the mine and try and decide where you're going to drop the mine. Um, but as you go on, if you continue, you continue uh, exploration. And so, you know, $3 million a year, typical small miner um, is, is something that's, that's not unusual. And again, it's, it's typically contracted out. Next slide, please. Um, so mining companies are essentially logistics and administrative companies. And what that means is that the mining company is the glue that holds all these little activities together. So um, they would be not necessarily owners of a drill or owners of a helicopter company or, or a magnetic survey or, or gravitometer type of surveying system. They will own the cargo ship that, that uh, supports the far north uh, exploration base. But they're the glue that kind of puts it all together into a logistics train that so that they can get a product from source to market. Next slide, please. So the, if we just look at exploration, for example, there are various activities associated with the actual exploration in, in terrestrial mining. There's core drilling, core logging, assays, aerial surveys, magnetometers, LIDAR, um, and, and, and it gets right down to feet, boots on the ground. So you might have a remote camp, you'd have to have provide housing, food, lodging, security, transportation, supplies. You, you might be renting special equipments, doing seismic surveys, uh, doing some very deep drilling, maybe EM sensors, some kind of road construction just to provide access. And what the mining company does is, again, it provides some logistics. It connects all this stuff. The mining company is not going to buy an airplane. They're certainly not going to invent an airplane, um, and and so they're going to contract out as a, a, a on a fee for service basis. So the job of the mining company then is to issue the contracts, to manage regulatory issues. They're the ones that have to apply, for example, for claims uh, or, or for uh, environmental assessments. They provide an overall cash flow, and they collect data. Next slide. So if we look at uh, the mining activity itself, then again, you know, the mining company is not going to invent a truck. They're not going to invent the explosive. They're not going to invent the jumbo drill that's, that's used to advance the drift or the, or the, the, the large haul truck or the, the, the scoop. They're certainly not going to invent the shaft uh, boring tool that you see on, on the lower right. Again, what the mining company is going to do is try and glue this all together into something that makes sense for them and, and for getting that product from, from its source into the end user. So they're going to issue contracts. They're going to look at you know, power contracts. They're not going to have, some might build their own power systems, but typically they will uh, import the power, whether it's diesel or, or, or now they're looking at small nuclear reactors as uh, uh, mine site power systems, um, or they just tie into the grid. And they look at water, waste, transport issues, they manage regulatory issues again, uh, going from exploration to mining, the, the, the change of, of uh, regulatory issues. They provide cash flow, they collect data, they purchase equipment, purchase and distribute supplies, provide maintenance in some cases. Uh, there are actually mines in the Sudbury area that are totally contract run. Uh, they, they are you know, they're down 4,000 feet underground and, and the whole mine is run on a contract basis and uh, the mining company just sits back and, and manages all of this logistics. Uh, they provide supplemental ground power sometimes. They provide safety and security management. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so I'm not going to belabor this with going through every step, but uh, because, and, and this is the fact finally before I move into some of the interesting stuff. So, so mining companies, uh, uh, again, if we're looking at the refining end of things, mining companies still have to figure out how to get, once you get the material out of its, in, 
in situ location, whether it's underground or, or surface mine, you still have to do things before you refine it. You might have to transport it, you might have to crush it, you might have to stockpile it uh, before you actually dump it into a smelter and, and try and get something out of it. So the mining company, they lose this all together. They might, the mining company may install and uh, engineer and design a, a pre-beneficiation process to crush or, or, or pre-refine the material to concentrate it a bit. But the mining company will not buy, will not buy necessarily a cargo ship to get material from, um, you know, from, from Sweden to Canada or vice versa. Um, they will instead lease out those transportation systems. Uh, the mining company will not invent a transcontinental or intercontinental uh, um, system for transportation of raw materials. They'll hire a train from one of the local train companies and, and, and move it that way. Um, there are two smelters in Sudbury that are publicly known. There's a third one that actually refines rhodium that nobody knows about. Um, two of the smelters, out of the two smelters in Sudbury, one of them actually does smelting uh, as a custom feature for the, they offer it to other mining companies. So they are not just smelting their own product, they're smelting it under contract to, uh, to other companies. So the mining company itself will, again, kind of glue all this stuff together by, by managing the contracts and collecting the data. Notice, the, notice there's some underlying themes here. They're collecting data, they're managing regulatory issues, they're providing cash flow, there's, they're, they're filling the gaps in between what they are able to contract and what they are uh, and, and what they cannot contract or cannot build. So uh, next slide, please. So now we get to ISRU operation cycle. And this is this is the mining cycle that I showed earlier, but when I give it to somebody like Jerry Sanders, he manages to mess it up and make it a little more clever. Um, so, but, it, but it, it, what it does do, what this, this does do is it still has the basic you know, five kind of major categories, but it starts pulling in some of the underlying stuff that I've been talking about. It starts pulling in the communications and autonomy, starts pu pulling in some of this construction needed for site preparation, starts talking about maintenance repair, and, and starts showing that this is kind of a, an ecosystem in terms of mining. And so we need to consider that as we start thinking about space mining. And so, next slide, please. So here we go. So if we're really gonna be doing space mining, if somebody really wants to do space mining, then you gotta start thinking about all these things. You gotta think about how are you gonna do the prospecting? How are you gonna manage? Take, take, there's, a, there's, a, there's a word here, it's called manage. How are you gonna manage the prospecting? How are you gonna manage the energy, the, the, the resources? How are you going to manage the mining activity itself? Do you want to do that on your own? How are you going to do the resource processing? Are you going to manage that? Are you going to manage the product uh, liquefaction, storage, and transfer? Are you going to manage the civil engineering, construction, and maintenance that's needed in order to support your entire operations? Last but not least, how are you going to manage the operations? And I would, I would suggest that the, the majority of the mining companies that are out there now manage their own operations largely because of trade secrets involved. So, my final slide, if you would please. So the final slide says, is Billy really saying, look, do you really want to be a space miner? And if you do, then you've got to think very carefully about being uh, technology agnostic. Um, you, you don't want to be building launch vehicles. You can buy those now. Cliff's Landers are, are showing you. Do you want to buy a rover? Sure. Do you want to build one? Well, why? Almost every university has one. Um, do you want to build a communication systems? Maybe you might have to, but maybe not. There are, there are a lot of communications providers out there who are very, very interested in, in working. Do you want to provide, um, you know, do you want to build a, a, a power plant? Um, and again, the question is why? Uh, you can you can create deals with power providers, solar whether it's running solar cells or nuclear power systems, whatever, and uh, you can buy it on a per kilowatt basis. Um, so so why would you want to do that? There, the, the final thing I want to leave you with is that there are only a very few space mining companies today. 
Everybody else in the ISRU field is really in the supply chain. And to be a space miner, what you've got to think about very carefully is how do you manage that? How do you manage the regulatory regime? Uh, how do you manage the cash flow? How do you manage the logistics? And how do you get the product from in situ to, to, uh, to, to the end user? And with that, Thank you so much, Dale. That's fantastic. Again, lots of people listening to you. And I can see Jerry Sanders is paying deep attention to these talks. So I'll pass over to Joseph again to uh, take the questions. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you, Dave, for the presentation. Yeah, Jerry Sanders is really active in uh, questions. But uh, I will first uh, read an interesting comment we had in the chat, followed by a related question exactly by Jerry Sanders. So George Barakos sorry if I pronounced the name wrong, uh, made the comment that mining companies are, or the comment that mining companies are essentially logistics and administrative companies might well be associated with what Serkan mentioned about the lack of interest from big mining industry players on off-earth mining. It seems that Sandvik or other mining equipment manufacturers could set foot on the moon first and not Rio Tinto or BHP. Um, well, from, from my experience in uh, a few conferences, one of them organized by Serkan, uh, we saw just before, was uh, I, I got the same feeling about this. Maybe Dale has also something to say. And a related question from Jerry is, so from the presentation, is it safe to say that mining companies will not invest in the hardware or infrastructure, but wait for the ability to sign a contract? Um, so I think I can answer both questions in, in one swoop. So the reason that mining companies, in my experience, don't really want to get involved with, with mining on another planet is very simple return on investment. Every mine operates on what's called a hockey stick curve. And uh, it's, it's a large investment at the front that tapers off until we're finally producing product. And um, of the life of a mine figures into that return on investment. So if that hockey stick curve is is you know set for 20 years there is not a mining executive in the world that's going to stand up in front of the shareholders and say hey we're going to space and you know never mind that roi thing that uh, that we talked about to get you to invest in this and so i think that's that's one of the reasons why we probably will have difficulty getting actual mining companies like ballet or, or rio tinto to to invest there's there are reasons why they might um but it's certainly the, the roi is, is kind of a an overriding uh, concern. Um, in terms of, of companies like Sandvik, Sandvik is a supplier chain uh, company. They produce hardware. They they don't necessarily be like Ethel Roth or Atlas Copco or, or you could name a, a, a gazillion different uh, suppliers. And those suppliers will go if there is a market. So again, you know, the question is, to be a space miner, you've got to think about how you put this all together and, um, and, and really provide the logistics. So I could not see, for example, a mining company uh, wanting to go to, uh, let's, let's call it the Lunar, lunar Mining Company, uh, Lunar Logger Brewing Mi and Mining Company. And uh, they want to go to the moon to, to mine water ice and make beer and sell it off for a million dollars a bottle. And um, they, they I could see them be very technology agnostic. You know, they're going to look around for uh, technologies that will suit. So when you start building a mine and you start planning a mine, you, you, you find out, uh, you, you do an exhaustive search for types of technologies that can suit your plans. What does your ore look like? What is it? How do you get it out of the, out of the ground? How do you ship it? How do you process it? Uh, how do you store it? Um, and you begin to look for technologies that meet those requirements. So it's very much like the, you know, this is direct for Jerry, it's very much like mission requirements being pushed down on a provider. So you, you start off with your, your lunar logger brewing company uh, mission requirements, top level requirements, and you push down and say, okay, well, you know, this rover works and that one doesn't, and oh, by the way, I don't want a rover, I simply want to drill it to move from point A to point B, so why do I need all this fancy rover navigation guide and stuff? And those are the kinds of things that, that would be Thank you, Dale. Uh, just one very quick question from Mark Sonter. Uh, he's asking, what are the core activities that mining companies dare not contract out? Quick, quick response to that. 
I'm sorry, say, the, say that again? What are the core activities that the mining companies dare not contract out? So which, uh, which core activities yes. will they keep in, in, in house? Uh, typically, it'll be the regulatory issues um, uh, they, 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 and the cash flow issues. So the administrative end of things, those are always kept in house. And typically at the back end where there's uh, intellectual property, such as uh, operational uh, recipes or, or smelting recipes, they tend to, they tend to kind of hang on that pretty tight. Everything else is up for grabs. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dale, I invite you and also all the speakers of this session to join our chat. Uh, Serkan already did it and there's a uh, huge discussion going on. So if you have the time, please uh, connect to the session and the chat and try to answer some of the questions that are still there. And then uh, to the next speaker. Thank Thanks so much, Joseph. Absolutely right. Yeah, I can see that Serkan is <laughs> busily replying to all of the questions that were posed to him. And Dale, there's many questions coming in right now for you. So hopefully you can see them through the course of this session.